Bruce and his wife Linda were drinking on the terrace of their large house in the suburbs. Bruce, a 42-year-old accountant, had achieved great success in his profession and was promoted to the post of vice president of the firm. Their expensive home reflected his financial success. Linda, an attractive brunette of 26, looked younger than her age. Thanks to a disciplined regimen of exercise and diet, her figure was that of a woman 10 years younger. Her most notable features were her large bust and long, slender legs. Linda was a primary school teacher, but as Bruce's income increased, she stopped working. Bruce and Linda's sex was very enjoyable for him, but less so for Linda. Things improved somewhat for her when the couple plunged into the world of open relationships last year. Although, according to Linda, the guys were nothing special. The parties, however, became less and less frequent, and that was what the evening was all about. I don't understand, Bruce said. Sarah and Bill left first, then Marie and Jim. Now we meet less and less often. Yeah, Linda replied. It's frustrating, but I think I know the reason. Is it true? Bruce asked, surprised. I think yes. What's the matter? Well, Linda began with obvious hesitation. The other day I was talking to Marie over a cup of coffee. Obviously the action didn't stop, but some of our friends went in a different direction. What does it mean, in the other direction? Well, Linda continued, I don't know how to say it. But mostly, some ladies began to find these evenings less exciting. You're kidding, said Bruce. No, I know you guys really like it, but Sarah was looking for excitement and began to find something new. What? Well, it's a form of party where couples and singles mix and you get a wider age range. So, Linda continued, Sarah told Marie, and that's where they go. They say it is the most exciting thing they have ever experienced. Who are these loners who go there? Asked Bruce. Oh, uh, young people are usually smart and attractive. I think that's what makes these kinds of parties more attractive. When Bruce returned with two fresh drinks, she took a sip, crossed her legs, and sighed quietly. What's the matter? asked Bruce. Oh, nothing. Probably just too much to drink and too much time has passed since one of our parties, so I'm curious. You want to go? Linda beamed with delight. Everything turned out to be even simpler than she had imagined. A few days later, Linda and Bruce were entertaining their friends Marie and Jim. It was late Saturday night after a candlelit dinner at which there was not a word about a party. Now, Relaxing in the balsamic summer night air and strengthened by wine, thoughts turned to sex. Bruce, for his part, was once again admiring the beautiful Marie, a 29-year-old blonde paralegal at a prestigious city law firm. It was Linda who turned the conversation to the circle group. Tell me, Marie, she began, what do you think about the circle? Oh, that's great. We really like it, don't we, dear? she said, turning to her husband, Jim. Yes, dear, he answered with a little less enthusiasm. Are you thinking about coming to the circle party? She asked Bruce and Linda. Well, I don't know, Bruce said, but it would be worth it. It's a completely different experience. Why is it called circle? Linda's eyes widened slightly, warning Marie as she continued. Well, the couple who host these parties have a huge house outside the city. Outside on the terrace there is a large circle, about five yards in diameter, drawn with yellow chalk. When a couple arrives at a party, they are given a collar with a lock and a plastic bracelet with the key to the lock. While one of the pairs is spending time with someone, the other puts on the collar, it is locked. And this is the signal to go out onto the patio, sit in a circle and stay there until his partner comes for him. The system is good, guarantees confidentiality and avoids embarrassment. Linda relaxed, pleased with Marie's description. The evening ended, and Jim, oddly enough, did not speak out about these parties. Thirty minutes later, after Marie and Jim had left, Linda and Bruce returned to the patio for a nightcap. Maybe we can try a party like this? Linda asked. I guess, Bruce began, the circle idea sounds strange, doesn't it? And many people will be strangers to us. 
Linda chimed in. I think it would be interesting to go to one of the parties to see what kind of people are there. We don't have to do anything. We might just have a drink and decide it's not for us. Maybe. The next day, Linda called Marie. Her friend asked curiously, So, are you guys coming to the circle party? I hope so. I just have to let Bruce get used to the idea. Look, just ask him to take you to one of the parties. Join the cuckold circle and let yourself have real sex for the first time. Your Bruce will be dying of curiosity and will want to hear everything. He will be so curious that he will soon be ready to entertain a real man in your home. And he will be so shocked when he sees that he will eat from your hands. Among other places, the women howled with laughter. Do you know what I really like? Asked Marie. What? Thinking about the guys in our old group who had sex with me and seeing them end up in a cuckolding circle for everyone to see. And once Bruce is there, you will become the boss in all your relationships. I'll talk to Bruce this evening. Fine. The next party will be this Saturday. So what do you say? Maybe we should stop by and see what all the fuss is about. We can always leave and go to the movies if we get bored. Yeah, why not? If Jim and Bill went, then everything must be fine. Bruce had mixed feelings. Linda had always enjoyed sex. He had his doubts about this open, swapping relationship. But he agreed, and it turned out to be exciting for both of them. On Friday evening, Bruce and Linda went to the first circle party. Linda was delighted, but Bruce was very doubtful. I'm not sure about that, he said. Don't worry, honey. I'm sure everything will be fine. Anyway, Bruce continued, just remember that we don't have to do anything. It could just be a chance to check things out without, you know, getting involved. As if this would happen, Linda thought. Half an hour later, they arrived at a house that almost looked like a mansion. The landscaping was expensive, including large torches lighting the front yard. I look like? Linda asked. Amazing. Bruce answered sincerely. In fact, he thought that Linda had actually put some effort into getting ready that evening. Her sexiest dress with a low slit and the highest heels, a visit to the hairdresser and new perfume. Just looking at her, Bruce began to feel a tingling sensation. His reverie was interrupted when the door opened. In front of them stood a beautiful woman of about 40, brunette, tall, and dressed to the nines. Hello, she said. You must be Linda and Bruce. Please come in. I'm Rachel. The lighting in the foyer was dim, but enhanced by a few candles. Quiet music and conversation could be heard from another room. Linda, Rachel said. You are just as beautiful as Marie said. I think you will be a most welcome addition to our little group. Bruce noticed that the hostess was addressing his wife, but not him. And here, Rachel continued, is your circle necklace and the key to the castle. Linda put the necklace and chain in her purse and put a plastic bracelet with a key on her wrist. Come with me. I'll show you the bar. Marie is already here and looking forward to meeting you. Great, Linda said, as she and Bruce followed their hostess into a large, dark-paneled room. It was actually a large library with floor-to-ceiling bookshelves and a fireplace. There was a bar at one end of the room. Bruce noticed that the bartender, a man about 40 years old, was wearing the same collar as the one given to Linda. Rachel noticed Bruce's curious gaze. He wears a collar, so he takes turns serving everyone who is sent to the circle, and does a few other things during the party. I see, said Bruce. In front of the bartender stood a man in his twenties, and an attractive blondie in her forties. Your champagne, ma am, said the bartender, placing a glass of sparkling drink in front of them. Here's your scotch, sir. Bruce thought the bartender was unusually polite. Bruce and Linda ordered white wine, which was poured and served with delightful efficiency. Here, ma'am, the bartender said, placing the drink on a napkin in front of Linda. Here's yours, buddy. Buddy, Bruce thought. What is he talking about? He's very polite, Bruce said to Rachel as they walked toward the open door of the library bar. Of course, this is simply part of the tradition of manners and politeness that we encourage at our meetings. 
They walked through the seating area, which was also dimly lit. A couple sat on the sofa in the corner and whispered to each other. From this area, they entered a very large room that could be described as a party room or perhaps a huge family room. There were five designated seating areas, a small bar in the corner, a dance floor, plenty of sofas, all interspersed with potted trees. The effect was complemented by candles and quiet music. On one side of the room were French doors leading out to the outdoor patio and backlit pool. There were about 20 people in the room, mostly gathered in small groups. Linda, it was Marie. Marie, hi, Linda said as they hugged. I'm so glad you came. And you too, Bruce, she added with a smile. Where is Jim? Bruce asked, hoping to catch on to someone familiar. Well, Marie answered, actually he's on the terrace, in the circle. You mean, Linda began. Exactly, wait, I will introduce you. Do not move. When Marie walked away, Bruce put his arm around Linda's shoulders. She shook it off when Marie returned with a handsome young man of about 20. Wow, Linda whispered to Bruce. Linda, Marie said, this is Mitchell. Mitchell is my best friend, Linda. Well, well, the man said approvingly, slowly and openly looking at Linda. All Marie's friends. And this, she said, is Bruce. Bruce shook hands with the man, who tried to squeeze his hand hard enough to make it clear who was stronger, and he clearly succeeded. Linda, Marie continued in her usual breathless and enthusiastic manner. Come with me. I want to introduce you to someone. When Linda followed Marie and her friend, Bruce went after them. Marie paused to dissuade him. Bruce, be smart and wait here, okay? I promise you will see her again. Marie led Linda to a corner of the room where a small group of people were standing and chatting. Instead of joining the group, she tapped the tall black man on the shoulder to get his attention. When he turned around, Linda saw a very handsome man of about 30 with an athletic build. He allowed his gaze to survey Linda very leisurely, which made her blush. James, said Marie, this is my friend Linda whom I told you about. Linda, James. James took Linda's hand in his and squeezed it warmly. Well, well, Marie, he said. You didn't give this lady her due. Nice to meet you, James, Linda said suddenly feeling very warm and hoping her face wasn't flushed. Would you take Linda under your arm for a while? I need to free my hubby from the circle for a few minutes. Of course, James said, winking at Linda. She will be in good hands. After Marie left, Black Adonis led Linda to the love chair across the room and sat down next to her. Linda felt the warmth of his legs pressed against her and took a sip of champagne. Where is your hubby, Linda? He asked. There he is, sitting by the door and looking at us, Linda answered. I see Bruce can't take his eyes off us. Why don't we give him something to think about? What do you mean? Linda asked. James placed his right hand on the back of the couch behind Linda and placed his hand on her shoulder. His touch made her jump slightly, but she did nothing to push her neighbor away. Instead, she crossed her legs and turned slightly towards him. I think we'll get along great, he said with a smile, gently stroking her shoulder. Linda took another sip of champagne. Bruce was unhappy. Everything seemed to be happening very quickly. He decided that if Linda was going to get to know a stranger so quickly, then he should try too, and return to the bar. Bruce looked around the room, but something wasn't quite right. James looked at Linda. I heard that your husband may not fully understand the rules of this house, right? Yes, it might be a shock, Linda replied with a grin. Well, I think you'll fit in very well here, Linda. And I think you will be very glad that you came. You think so? She asked, somewhat flirtatiously, getting into the mood of the conversation. Oh yeah, especially when we bring your hubby on board. We should put a collar on him from the outside until he sorts out his affairs and objects. I hope I am not mistaken that you will become the happiest lady before this night ends. I want to be sure that you will come again. Let's see. He slowly brought his face closer to Linda's. She knew he was going to kiss her. It seemed like an eternity passed before he touched her, and a variety of thoughts raced through her head. 
How will Bruce react? How will she react? Will this happen? Does she want this? She answered the last question in the affirmative. Then his lips touched hers. Even though there were many people in the room, it didn't matter to her. His gentle kiss only helped her make a decision. When she felt his tongue were probing her lips, she immediately opened up to meet him. She moaned softly as she began to fully participate in the kiss, pressing her mouth to his. There is no turning back. She felt her pussy moisten and realized that she was going to give herself to this man. When their kiss ended, Linda was almost out of breath from the sensations coursing through her body. If he does everything as good as kissing, she thought, then I definitely have problems. I think it's time I introduced you to what this club is all about, don't you? What do you mean? I mean, I think you should put this collar around your hubby's neck and send him to sit in a circle. Linda got up and found Bruce at the bar. Hi, honey, she said. Are you having fun? Am I having fun? Well, it seems so, he said with a hint of bitterness in his voice. Do not be like that. We agreed to try it. I hope you don't mind if I... She took the collar out of her pocket and reached up to place it around his neck. Honey, is this necessary? Shh. Now turn around so I can secure it. He did as she asked and heard the small lock close. I hope it's not too tight. Perhaps it was the strange sensation from the collar that brought Bruce's consciousness out of his slumber. Everything started to feel very wrong. Looking around more closely, he noticed that there were definitely more men than women, and there didn't seem to be as many single women among the young, fit guys. Then he noticed that only men were sitting in a circle on the street, and their wives and young guys were heading towards the stairs. Damn, he muttered. They're taking me for a fool. We're leaving, Linda replied. What? We just arrived and I want to spend some time with James. You knew from the very beginning what it was. How long have you and Marie been planning to trick me into coming here? Just close your eyes. You just need to get used to the idea. I'm not going to get used to it. You'll get used to it. Jim and Bill got used to it. We've both had sex with other people. This is no different. Very different. It involves humiliation and disrespect, and you have already lied and weaved behind my back. I bet you and your new boyfriend were giggling at poor naive Bruce offering his wife to other men. I have no idea what Jim and Bill are thinking, but I'm not them. You know that I won't agree to this, otherwise you would have told me earlier. The parties are aimed at married women. It's really nice that Jim and Bill are so supportive of Marie and Sarah. This is true dedication and self-confidence. It seems to me that the parties are more focused on guys using married women for their own pleasure. That's bullshit. If you really loved me, you'd let me do this and we could continue our happy, supportive relationship. Linda smiled triumphantly as her husband's eyes dropped downwards. After what seemed like an eternal pause, he looked into her eyes. That's the problem. I love you and thought you loved me. I'm leaving. As Bruce moved towards the door, James approached him. Where are you going? You can't leave until I give permission. Bruce didn't answer. You should stay and see a real man having sex with your wife. Trust me, once you see it, you will know that you cannot compete. We'll break the rules and let you watch for the first time. Bruce looked at Linda, expecting a change of heart, an objection, anything. But there was none. He didn't like that this James guy took it for granted that he could get the better of his wife like that. He was annoyed with himself. But most of all, he couldn't believe that Linda was agreeing and seemed to be enjoying it. He turned to James. Are you going to try and stop me? It may not be as easy as you think. When James hesitated, he simply walked out, figuring Linda would follow him. Linda's thoughts were racing. She knew that she had to leave with Bruce, run after him, and try to improve the relationship. Some of the things he said made her feel awkward but she was furious that Bruce had embarrassed her in front of everyone. Why couldn't he be more like Jim, even though she didn't think much of Jim? Sarah and Marie were suddenly nearby, chatting incessantly, confirming how unreasonable Bruce was. What she asked for is quite reasonable. It does not harm anyone. Linda wasn't so sure, but she stayed, listened to the barrage of advice, and didn't follow him. James approached her, 
Don't worry. Sometimes we have this initial reaction. He'll come to his senses. Just leave him for a few hours to calm down. You can still get what you came here for, but you can deal with Bruce tomorrow. Let's go upstairs. She hesitated, but then accepted his offered hand. A few minutes later, Linda stood in the center of the room, and her future lover James sat in an easy chair and looked at the sexy wife who was about to become his. He always liked the first time best, and a fight with his husband made everything even sweeter. He wondered if she would be scared when she saw his huge manhood. Would she scream or cry? In any case, he was sure that she would become a convert, and he was looking forward to this moment. Linda, meanwhile, tried not to think about her husband, feeling giddy at the prospect of undressing in front of a stranger. She reached behind her and pulled the zipper down on her dress. She desperately wanted to impress. Although the fight had ruined the anticipation and excitement, she was sure she still wanted it. Shrugging, she pulled the top of her dress down to her waist, revealing a lavender bra that barely contained her breasts. Oh, baby, you make me very happy, James said. I just know that you and I will get along great. It occurred to her that Bruce had helped her choose this dress. Let's see the rest. With these words, she let the dress fall to her feet. She tossed it aside and stood with her legs apart and her hands on her hips. James saw an appropriate garter belt, panties, and black stockings. Linda reached behind her, this time to unclasp her bra. She let it fall to the floor and took her breasts in her hands, as if offering them to the man for approval. Come here and look at me closer. Linda walked over to James and stood between his spread legs. The sensations were beyond her strength. This was just the beginning. She put her hands on his head and pulled him towards her. But annoying images of Bruce kept flashing through her head. James lowered Linda to his knees. She could no longer even pretend to be at ease as she had been before. James smiled and pulled down the zipper of his trousers. I think you'll find it was worth it, he said with a seductive smile. Get him, he said softly. Get my gift for you. Linda slowly reached out to him through the zipper opening. Oh, God, she said. Come on, baby. Do not make me wait. It was everything she dreamed of. At that moment, she tried to imagine what this would mean for her and for her marriage. Don't stop, James said. James touched her head, signaling that the time for foreplay was over. He knew well what needs this attractive married woman had. He will enjoy her first acquaintance with a real man in her life. They both stood up and took off the rest of each other's clothes. They kissed while standing next to the bed. She couldn't help but compare it to Bruce's kiss, but this kiss was purely sexual, without any tenderness. They moved onto the bed. Please, be gentle, she cried. James had no intention of being gentle. It hurt. It hurt a lot. She probably deserved it by treating Bruce the way she did, but she tried to put him out of her mind again. Linda was completely absorbed in her desire and feelings that she experienced for the first time in her life. Even under such circumstances, she felt momentarily guilty towards her husband, but this feeling soon passed. Finally, both relaxed in each other's arms. Something seemed missing, and the image of Bruce came flooding back so suddenly that she panicked. Linda stood up and began to get dressed. James, looking at her, suggested that they take their time and give themselves one more run. Linda didn't like this phrase. It seemed cheap and easy to her. She hurried to get dressed and returned to Bruce. She felt very embarrassed. She liked the sex, but it turned out to be more painful than she expected. It wasn't as good as her friends thought it would be. Maybe she just needed to get used to the extra size. Bruce ruined everything. If he hadn't left, she wouldn't have continued to think about him. She didn't expect to think about him at all. This was supposed to be her night. James spoke up. In two weeks, you and Bruce will come to the next party. Hope so. If you have any problems with him, contact me. I can come to you. Show him a new situation and make him realize the inevitable. She left the room and ordered a taxi from the bar. On the way home... She looked forward to cuddling with her husband and getting into their cozy, warm bed. Bruce burst into his car, his world crumbling around him. Despite his rage, 
He managed to wait before driving, partly to calm down, but mostly because he expected Linda to follow him, and again he was disappointed by his wife's actions. He drove home, trying not to think about what Linda might be up to, and failing. He realized that the collar was still on him and tried to rip it off, but it would not budge and he felt ashamed. Why didn't he get her out of there? Maybe he is a weakling. Maybe Linda saw something in him that he didn't. His mind continued to race, trying to hold on to any coherent thought. He ordered himself to breathe and think. This helped. Having calmed down, he began to consider the possible options. Ignore, accept, divorce. Until tonight, he really liked his lifestyle. God, where to start? Arriving home, he immediately went to the workshop and, using wire cutters, removed the collar. Just looking at it made bile rise in his throat. He returned to the kitchen and threw it on the bar counter. He went upstairs and collected his toiletries, clothes, and laptop. His camping gear was already packed and sitting in the back of his truck, ready to head into the mountains if the weather forecast was good for the weekend. He felt best in the mountains and decided that was where he needed to be now. It took him less than ten minutes to get ready. As he was leaving, he noticed Linda's phone on the sideboard. She constantly forgot it, especially when they went out somewhere together. He thought about why she did this and decided that the phone might provide some clues. He knew her password and was able to connect the phone to his laptop and download data from the SIEM card, including call history and SMS. It didn't take long. He put the phone back and left. When Linda's taxi arrived at the house, the house was dark. Linda thought that Bruce was probably pretending to be asleep and began to fuss. She noticed his truck was missing and hurried into the house. There were no messages, just a cut collar on the bar counter. No, 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 it can't be that he really left. Bruce literally headed for the mountains, going to one of the remote camps that he knew well. A few hours later, calls and voice messages started pouring in from Linda. He ignored calls, but listened to all messages and did not answer any of them. He thought the timing of the first call was interesting, indicating that she had spent a lot of time at the party after he left. Her messages that first evening were full of concern. Where is he? Is everything okay with him? Can't they talk? He stopped to rest and called his parents, explaining to his mother that Linda had done something inappropriate without specifying what, that he was fine, and that he was on his way. Oh, things must be bad if you're going there. Are you sure you're okay? Why not come home and we'll take good care of you? Bruce smiled. Thank you, Mom. But I need to be alone. Linda will probably call you and ask about my whereabouts. Could you tell her that I'm okay and not to go to the police? It would be beneficial. I won't say anything. She didn't like Linda, believing that she was self-centered, always focused on herself and not on others. But Bruce did not notice this, perhaps until now. Bruce reached the camp late, settled down and fell asleep exhausted. Late in the morning, he walked onto the long trail, immediately feeling the benefits of wandering through timeless landscapes. There was something soothing about the mountains. They were always changing, but at the same time, they remained the same. They were not touched by the troubles of people, including his own. He spent the week exploring new trails and repeating old favorites. He met a lot of really nice people on the trails and often shared food and drinks with them at the campsite. Basically, these were married couples, people who, like him, loved outdoor recreation. He himself suggested routes to some less experienced people, and several people went hiking and climbing with him. At times, he had a really good time until thoughts of his wife brought him back to reality. He got on very well with the campground owners Pete and Jen, with whom he shared a couple of barbecues. The farmers initially decided to take up camping to stay afloat financially, but they seemed to have really enjoyed sharing their home with visitors. It was the best place he had seen, rustic and right in the middle of the park. They explained that the rustic look of the house was partly because they didn't want to invest their savings and felt like they wanted to do less rather than more work as they weren't getting any younger, leaving a message at work asking for the vacation he was entitled to. He was confident that this would not be a problem since he had already closed all year-end accounts for his clients. In the following days, 
Linda's messages became increasingly angry, demanding that he tell him where he was, that he should come home, that he was acting like a child and should grow up. Surprisingly, the small cafe had Wi-Fi, and he used online banking to transfer their savings to other accounts in his name in case Linda had any ideas. He doubted that she would do it, not because of any newly discovered moral principles, but simply that she seemed absolutely sure that he would return. He left the checking account into which bills and spending money were transferred, so he doubted she would notice anything. A few days later, he decided to look at what was downloaded on Linda's phone. The calls seemed to be only from her usual friends, but the SMS turned out to be a surprise. It was obvious that the party had been planned for a long time. Sarah and Maria were clearly the instigators, promoting the benefits of sex and complete control over their relationships. There was plenty of evidence that they all deserved more. More control, more excitement, more sex, just more. Jim and Bill's fall into slavery was used as a role model for Bruce. He noted a complete lack of empathy for both husbands, where love was repeatedly mentioned, but usually in the context of justifying their actions or exchanging them for more control. Linda's last text messages to him had escalated to a level he could only describe as rage, which amused him greatly, but there was no sign of remorse or apology. This showed that he couldn't hide forever and had to make some decisions. Linda was shocked that Bruce left, that he was serious when he said he was leaving. At that moment, she thought he meant leaving the party, but maybe he meant leaving home or leaving her. No, it's just funny. He just needs time to cool down, and then he'll come back to her. His camping gear was missing, which meant he was playing Boy Scout on one of his little camping trips. She called and texted, trying her best to look like a concerned wife. After all, she was concerned, but she equally hated not being able to control events. When he didn't return on Sunday night, she was annoyed and reluctantly called Bruce's mother. The response was icy to say the least. His mother didn't know if he was okay or not, but they talked. Linda asked if he had discussed their little problem and received a sharp, no. But I'm sure you did something especially stupid. Linda hung up. She was furious that he had not contacted her for a week. Sarah and Marie became semi-permanent guests in the house, advising her what to do and what decisive action was necessary when he returned. Bruce was surprised when Jim called him and said that he had heard that he had left and asked him to meet him and Bill. He thought that Linda was behind this, but found that he, too, was curious about their marital relationship. In any case, he decided to return, so he agreed to meet them at a bar outside the city before leaving home, insisting that the wives not be present. Sarah told Linda the details of the meeting. She also instructed Bill about the benefits of their new marital relationship. Judging by the place and time, Linda suspected that he might return home and meet them on the way. Finally breaking through, he was indeed much more stubborn than she had expected. However, he was on his way, and she needed to prepare plans and options for his return. Bruce ordered a beer, took it to the booth already occupied by Jim and Bill, and greeted his friends. Thanks, Bruce, but I don't drink anymore, Bill objected. Bruce was surprised. Since when? And then he could not resist, and added, Or since Sarah said that you weren't allowed. Neither Bill nor Jim laughed. Bruce thought the reaction was strange. They always laughed at each other's jokes. Bruce continued, This may seem a little strange, but the question is, None of you are writing this down. He noticed Bill twitch in his chair. Are you serious? Sarah told me to leave the phone on, Bill said. Turn it off, otherwise I'll leave. Bruce was indignant. Bill complied. What happened to you two, now you do everything they say? Jim lowered his head. I think so, but it's for the better. Marie says this means we have clear boundaries and less conflict. We don't fight anymore, there are no secrets, everything is open, and she is much happier. What are you saying? Do you have a right to any opinion? Bill tried to intervene. Bruce, it's not as bad as you think. 
I genuinely enjoy watching Sarah with other guys. It turns me on. I think that without parties, she could have already started an affair on the side, and we would have broken up. I really don't want this. I love my life, and I'm lucky to have someone as hot as Sarah. This is not for me. I can still almost enjoy watching it, but what is it about the collars, the circle, and the attitude of these guys that is terrifying? Do you really like it? To be honest, Jim said, not really. The circle is a little too humiliating, and it would be better if the guys weren't so, so... Bastards? Bruce finished. And I don't mind, it's just the reality of the situation. Watching them would change your attitude towards this, Bruce. Honestly, they're like fucking machines, we just can't compete with them. When I think about it from Sarah's point of view, I can see why she likes it. I don't think she'll have the opportunity to go back, Bill said. Bruce said in surprise, What? She can't come back, even if it's all at your expense. Do you receive any compensation? Yes, we still do the same things. Only sex has become different, and it's just sex. She's not in love with any of the guys. So, are you still making love to Sarah? Well, ooh, yes, I am. It's just a little different. She gets the pleasure, but we're still very close. And you think this is acceptable? The conversation continued. Bruce became more and more perplexed. To be honest, guys, I just don't understand. It's so one-sided. It's not love for anyone. I think you should read the text messages I have on my laptop. Bruce showed them some of the worst messages from Linda's phone. At first he thought they would refuse to read them, but they started looking. The extent of the derogatory comments made by all three wives was appalling. He expected a furious reaction, but all he received from each of them was a shrug. And the summary is that it is simply more than what they are used to. Well, I give up, Bruce breathed. I guess we're just wired differently. Look, it was good to see you. Take care of yourself. And I sincerely hope that everything works out for you. But I have to go and take care of some things. As soon as Bruce left, Bill called Sarah and said he was on his way home. Bruce drove to his house, and when he entered, Linda seemed to be waiting for him, and had certainly taken the time and effort to look her best. He had to admit that she actually looked good, and he missed her. Finally back, traveler, said Linda. I missed you too, honey. Lisa's first tirade was about the lack of contact with him, which he believed was an attempt to catch him off guard and make him feel guilty. It didn't matter, so he didn't answer. Linda was annoyed that he couldn't see how unacceptable his actions were, but eventually she dropped the topic. While there was a pause, Bruce asked, Was everything as you imagined? Lisa smiled. Yes, it was absolutely amazing if you want. I can tell you about it. I've heard that husbands like to relive it and hear all the dirty details. I don't like it. I just wanted you to confirm your betrayal, which you did. Linda pouted again in disappointment. This is actually difficult to explain since you did not participate in it as part of a couple. It was something for me and it wouldn't have affected us at all or it wouldn't have existed unless you left in anger. Just at that moment, a car pulled up. Bruce was amazed to see Marie, Sarah, and James coming out. What's wrong with you and your conspirators, Linda? Bruce asked. I can't believe you're using me again. Don't you remember how it worked out last time? All three walked straight into his house, which angered Bruce even more. James sat arrogantly while Marie and Sarah began to reproach Bruce themselves. To be honest, he hardly listened to them caught something about how upset Linda was, about benefits, about sexually satisfied wives, extremely happy wives, that they deserve it, and Jim and Bill couldn't be happier. Bruce burst in, Are you sure about that? It seems to me that you set them up and didn't bother to ask. They denied sex to get their way. I can't understand why you would treat anyone this way, let alone the ones you claim to love, but congratulations. You succeeded. You humiliated the men you claim to love, but you won. None of this is true. You won't understand until you see James and Linda, Sarah cried. That won't happen, Bruce replied. James stood up and seemed proud of himself as he walked arrogantly towards Linda and put his arm around her waist. Listen, Bruce, 
If you don't like collars and humiliation, we can agree another way. She can become a regular. I'll serve her here and keep her polite. Everyone wins. Now why don't we go upstairs and then you'll realize that Linda doesn't really have much of a choice. You should get out of my house. James responded, Tell you what, why don't I call Mike and invite him to the party? Now we'll do all three. And then you'll have the added benefit of seeing Sarah and Marie naked. It's really hot to watch a married woman submit. James began making calls on his cell phone. At the same time, Bruce took two long steps, lowering his hip and shoulder, adding weight to the blow that landed on James's face. Screams were heard from all the women. A flash of pain shot through Bruce's fist. Luckily, James fell but was still moving. He started to rise to his feet, and when he was halfway up, Bruce threw a powerful kick that caught him in the balls. This time he fell hard. Sorry, ladies, it looks like there won't be a gangbang today and your bull will be out of action for a while. Screams and screams continued everywhere. Bruce picked James up and led him to the door, the women following behind him. As he pulled him into the car, James muttered, He's not like your rags. I finally got through to someone. Bruce laughed. Bruce actually felt good. All the pent-up disappointment came out. He told Marie and Sarah to get out too and never come back. And then he turned to Linda. You too. But I live here. I can't leave. We need to figure everything out. This is not what I wanted. I love you. Bruce frowned. Oh, then everything is fine if you love me. Do you really believe you'll be safe if you stay? Should you go with your girlfriends? Of course I will be safe. You will never harm me. Maybe not, but what I feel for you at the moment, even I'm not sure. I'll leave, but only for a few hours until you calm down. Just go away. He watched them leave and felt... What did he feel? Maybe a little better and surprisingly calm. He had been expecting Sarah and Marie to arrive, but James had been a surprise, and he smiled at the thought of the blow and how abruptly it had interrupted his confident mood. It occurred to him that a report of assault might be filed against him, but he suspected that James's pride would prevent this. This whole scene confirmed what he had planned. He went to his truck, got new locks, and started installing them on the outside doors. This turned out to be easier than he thought since they were the same size and brand as the existing ones. He then reprogrammed the garage door and security system, after which he loaded, or rather threw, Linda's clothes into her car, and then sat down and enjoyed a cool beer in his workshop. Linda returned at seven in the evening alone, but could not get into the house. Her key did not work, which was strange. He wouldn't change the locks, would he? Then she tried the back door and the garage, and then she started knocking furiously on the door until he finally answered. He opened the door and said, Your things are in the car, and quickly closed the door. Linda began knocking and screaming again, attracting the neighbor's attention. As the screams continued, Bruce approached the door again. Unless you want me to tell all your precious neighbors what you've been up to, you better leave. He looked angrier than Linda had ever seen him. We need to talk. I think I misjudged the situation, Linda said. You think so? Don't be sarcastic. I listened to Sarah and Marie too much and misjudged the situation. I thought you would agree, even be happy about it. Anything else? Asked Bruce. I love you and I want us to stay together. We can't part because of such a trifle. The most interesting thing is that you didn't apologize. I'm sorry I hurt you. But not, I'm sorry I had sex with a guy. You're just sorry things didn't work out as well as you hoped. You still think your actions were reasonable. You're so self-obsessed, it's amazing. You seem to be confusing manipulation and control with love. Well, now you are free to seek all the excitement you deserve. Good luck. Linda began to panic, realizing for the first time what she was risking. How could she be so wrong? She begged, I don't want this. I want you, us, everything as it was. Forgive me. I will do everything. You always treated me very well, maybe even too much, and I took it for granted. It's too late. There's no turning back. Let's say I can still forgive sex, but I cannot forgive betrayal and will never be able to trust you again. I wish you would leave. Now. 
This is not the end. I know that you still love me. I will bring you back. Bruce walked her to the door and closed it behind her. It was like closing part of his life. Bruce decided not to divorce Linda, and she didn't file a petition, repeatedly trying to get them back together, which suited Bruce because it meant she was playing well. He didn't think she couldn't maintain that facade forever. She surprised him when she agreed to sell the house. He guessed she was desperate for money. Bruce quit his job and took up freelance accounting as a mountain guide. He completed all the instructor courses, which also helped build a network of contacts. His passion was the outdoors, and he knew how to convey that passion to his clients. During the spring and summer season, he spent most of the day in the mountains and planned to begin more serious winter climbs. He felt healthier and fitter. He bought a 50% share of the camp from Pete and Jen. The camp brought in very little profit, so as soon as he invested more in its most of his money, he will think about divorce again. After all, being an accountant has its advantages. Bruce had big plans to expand the camp. He was going to double the number of places, organize guided holidays, and create mountain bike trails. Peter and Jen's daughter Carol kept horses as a hobby, and they believed that riding holidays could be lucrative. He really liked Carol, who had returned to her parents after a painful divorce. She was caring, attentive, and constantly ebullient. She was also delighted that Bruce was involved, easing the burden on her parents. They worked together a lot, and the more he got to know her, the more he liked her. Plus, she was beautiful, which also helped. On reflection, he realized that he was not happy in his previous job, but it was profitable and made Linda happy. If you think about it, he did a lot of things just to make Linda happy. Perhaps the party was the best thing that could have happened, although not exactly what Linda had in mind. Surprisingly, in mid-August, Jim appeared at the camp, and he and Marie were separated. Bruce gave him a few random shifts, and he stayed for a few months, looking fitter and happier, more like the guy he'd met in the beginning. Jim said Linda refused to socialize with Sarah and Marie, and because she didn't have a partner, she couldn't go back to the parties even if she wanted to. James never got in touch. After ignoring Linda's calls, texts, and emails, she showed up at the camp and asked to speak to him so politely that he could hardly refuse. Many of the words were the same, but this time it seemed to him that she was sincerely sorry. It was noticeable that she used the pronoun I much less and talked more about his feelings. It turned out that she had been seeing a counselor in an attempt to get help. The counselor asked her to look at things from Bruce's point of view and she admitted that she had taken him for granted and had become selfish. They talked for a long time and brought all their problems to the surface. Bruce noticed that Linda was beginning to hope that they could work things out after all. He turned to her. You broke something that cannot be fixed, Linda, no matter how much you want it. I will not live with this mistrust. In the end, it will destroy us both. She was about to object when he added, Besides, I met someone. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. 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 Listening to the next one.